like to travel and I especially enjoy visiting ancient monuments and places that have survived the years and people's tendency to destroy them. When I visit places like this one, the Valley of the Temples in Sicily, it helps me to see not what's there now, but what used to be there. On my travels, I usually spend some time searching out the African history of a given place, and it has been my experience so far that I've always found it. Wherever people have moved around, migrated, African people were there. Throughout most of history, we traveled on foot or by boat for trade or out of curiosity or a desire to expand our horizons just as others did. Sometimes we were transported far from home against our will, but we were there and we were here. When I walk around the inner city of Calgary, there are a few surviving buildings that help me envision what used to be. And I see those places through the eyes of those of African descent who arrived at the same time as Europeans and people from other parts of the world. I wanted to share a few slides with you from the family of Daniel and Charlotte Lewis who arrived in the late 1800s. I'm not going to spend as much time with them as I did this morning, but what is important for you to know is that this was a very well-established, successful family from Toronto who came to this part of the world. This is one of my favorite members of the family, Ethel, who didn't ride sad sidle back in those days. Uh, she was also a poet and a carpenter, very tall, elegant, beautiful lady, grew up in this house um, that was where the Westbrook Mall is now. Daniel Lewis was a carpenter and he built this home for his family, including the Ware children, John Ware's children who went to live with the Lewises because they were their grandparents. They were John's wife's, Mildred's parents. So the Ware children spent, um, spent some of their growing years living there as well. I'm going to make the assumption that everybody in the room knows who John Ware was. Um, I do a lot of work about him. If you want to learn more about him, you can come see me another time about that. Given the, the Lewis family history of upward mobility and marrying well, it's no surprise that the oldest of their children married Southern Alberta's most famous and popular black resident, John Ware. Um, he had established himself as a figure of such importance and influence that some historians have said that if he had not died in 1905, if he had lived another seven years to the beginnings of the stampede, that um, the big four who financed the first Calgary stampede might have been known as the big five. So I wanna, want you to spend a moment looking at that face and in the first act of translation that I'm going to ask you to make today, I want you to envision what my life would have been like. Retranslate my life growing up in a cowboy-obsessed city if John Ware's face had been on that poster. There were many, many, many people of African descent who were here in John Ware's time. I do other presentations where I talk about the lives of these amazing folks that I unfortunately can't do for you today, but I wanted you to see them. Just because they were here. Connections were formed between these groups of people um, that had already estab established themselves uh, when the wave of black immigration that brought my ancestors here came in around 1910. So this newspaper article is from the Calgary Herald. Was it the Herald? or Yes, the Herald uh, from 1910. It talks about 
a dance that was held as a fundraiser for the Colored People's Protective Association that attracted 150 black people. So when you look at the census data of that time, you wouldn't think that there were that many black people around, and I'm sure not every black person in the city went to the dance. So you begin to understand the kind of research I do and how deep and long-standing this community of African people was. So it, it was into this already establishing community that my um, maternal great-grandparents, both sets, arrived in Western Canada in 1910. Uh, that is Rufus and Drusilla Smith, and standing with them is my grandfather, my mom's dad, George Smith, picture taken in Regina. That's the only photo that I've ever seen that has both of my great-grandfathers in it. This was taken near Maidstone, Saskatchewan. Um, Willie Glover, my younger great-grandfather, is the tall one in the back, and Rufus is the shorter one in the front there. So it was these folks that helped lay the groundwork for the multiracial and multicultural society in which we're now living. But the arrival of these large numbers of African-American farmers and their families met with tremendous backlash by white folks. And the newspapers of the day tell that story better than I can. Um, it is a story of bumpy times and disappointed hopes for my people who had thought they were going to the promised land, in part because what they had heard about and learned about Canada through their rich heritage of music, through those spirituals that spoke of this place as a place to escape to. This was an order in council signed by then Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier, which was uh, intended to stop that migration. The, the backlash against us was so powerful that they wanted to end it. Um, it was a lobby of the community that the Lewises had come out of in Ontario and Toronto, a, a, a block of people that said, we will vote you out of office if you implement this order in council that prevented it from happening. The government eventually employed other means and other methods, and they did effectively stop this immigration. So it ended with about 1,500 to 2,000 people who came. They had wanted many more to come. They had really wanted to establish themselves as um, a community that was allowed to contribute with all the talents that they had. In a, in a much larger way. So the group remained small. Despite the challenges of the bitterly cold winters, which they were not used to, and uh, the heavy tree cover on their land, and that ugly racism, they persisted. And they built five small black communities in northern Alberta and Saskatchewan. Keystone, which is now Breton, Campsey, Junkins, Maidstone, Saskatchewan, where my folks went, and Amber Valley, the largest and best known of, this, of these communities, which is just east of Athabasca. Um, it is the most northerly community of, of people of African descent that has ever existed in the world. They did their best to con contribute, uh, including the young men joining the First World War effort. Those are two of John Ware's sons, Arthur and William, who fought for Canada in the First World War. That's my grandfather, the uh, little boy you saw in the previous photograph, who also served. <clears throat> this 1918 article attests to a growing opportunity for black men to find employment as porters and servers with the railroad companies a situation that continued throughout the decades and well, well into my lifetime. The majority of black men that I knew as a child worked for the railroads in some capacity and lived in this neighborhood. This is uh, from the headlines last week. This is the Enoch Sales house that burned down just last week. Uh, earlier on, I said that when I look at Calgary, I see not only what is there now, but what used to be there. That house was an incredible touchstone for me in terms of 
remembering and reminding myself of our heritage because at one time it was a house in a neighborhood where my people lived for a variety of reasons, um, proximity to the railroads being one of them, discrimination in housing, discrimination in a, from the banks around um, more, being able to get mortgages, um, as I said, proximity to the railroads and for safety, most of the people of African descent who arrived here between 1910 and 1950 lived in the East Village or the Beltline. So that home, the Enoch Sales home, is just about a block and a half away from this one, which was one of many, many, many homes that were occupied by the people who were my elders when I was a child growing up in Calgary. I visited with Judy, who is the little girl on the bike there, last week in Vancouver, and she gave me these photos and some others, which I loved. I also heard some stories um, from her and stories that were corroborated by my mom and my aunts about how black people interacted with each other back in those days. Apparently, people gathered socially pretty well every night but very rarely was anything planned. They just wandered over to each other's homes and popped in. Um, and even if they had to live two or three families to these homes, as many did, um, they really made homes. Um, my Aunt Edie and Uncle Andrew, who you'll hear more about later, lived in the back of this house with the Williams family. These were places full of life and loud laughter and the best food you could ever imagine. And I wish that was the whole story. That's my Aunt Edie. Because these beautiful people who, um, who were really trying hard also struggled. And sometimes the struggles were too much. Some people didn't survive or didn't survive intact. Some people did well, better than fine. And I'm going to share uh, one of the success stories from our community with you. Oliver Bowen grew up on that farm. This is his uncle, a man, Bodie Bowen, who was a very important figure in my life growing up in Calgary. Uh, it's Oliver closer to me on this side, and Vern, his brother, who supplied me with this photo and who I'm very grateful for. He is a, a living library of our black history. Um, and who also was partly responsible for Oliver's success because he helped put his brother through engineering school at the University of Calgary. Oliver went on to be the special projects manager for the city of Calgary. He's a special projects engineer when the sea train was being built. So it was him who implemented and planned the sea train. And uh, the Oliver Bowen light rail vehicle maintenance facility in northeast Calgary is named for him. You can visit it if you wish. But this article also attests to the backdrop of the Calgary that this community was trying to raise their children in, that these folks were living in. This uh, is an article about a riot where about 200 white men attacked the home of uh, a black man who happened to be John Ware's nephew um, and tore the house apart. It's a, a long story about um, a, a really minor incident that left, led to this attack, um, very unjustified attack, and they tore the house down and they were carrying the husband of one of, of John Ware's niece, Eva, out of the house. They had stripped off his uniform and they were bearing him away when the police arrived and were able to, I assume, save his life. So that was, uh, that was the world in which we were living. So spaces like this one, Lou's famous chicken fry, were very necessary, black-owned spaces, because the porters needed somewhere reliable to eat and to network and find out where they could get a bed for the night, etc. Black people were routinely barred from many dining establishments and hotels. And yet, the very notion of the existence of black spaces and black-owned businesses, as we saw from the attack on the, on the business that was owned by one of John Ware's nephews, 
caused great offense, just that the existence of those places caused offense to many white Calgarians, and it was an incredibly difficult and strange dynamic to navigate, the dynamic that you can't come into our spaces, but you also can't have your own. <clears throat> Since we're in a church today, I am going to end my presentation talking a little bit about a man of the church, my Uncle Andrew, who I mentioned earlier, lived in the back of the, the house down there close to the, the house that burned down last week um, with my aunt. Um, he was establishing himself as a minister here in Calgary at that time. He's the tall one in the back. And I am going to bring Miranda forward now to sing a song that was uh, a spiritual, it's a, an old song, called Elijah Rock. Shout, shout, Elijah Rock, coming of the Lord. Elijah Rock, shout, shout, shouting. Elijah Rock, I'm coming of the Lord. Satan is a liar and a conjurer too. You don't mind, I hear conjure you. If I could, I surely would Stand on the rock where Moses stood Where Elijah Rock Shout, shout Elijah Rock, coming of the Lord Elijah Rock Shout, shout, shouting Elijah Rock, I'm coming of the Lord Elijah saw him wheeling the middle of a wheel John talked about him in the book of the seven seals but some say the rose of Sharon others say the prince of peace but I could tell this whole world had been a rock and a shelter for me Shout, shout, Elijah Rock, coming of the Lord. Elijah Rock, shout, shout, shouting. Elijah Rock, I'm coming of the Lord. Elijah Rock, shout, shout, Elijah Rock, coming of the Lord. Elijah Rock, shout, shout, shouting. was growing up in Campsie, he was the only black child in the school that he attended, and that's because his farm was directly adjacent to the school. There were many other people from our community who lived very nearby, but they were not allowed to attend the school because they were technically outside of the borders of the school. Now, it was a very um, casual arrangement they had for the schools up there. If a kid lived close to a school, they didn't make them 
you know, go 20 miles in the horse and buggy in the winter to get to the, the one that was actually their catchment area. It was, it was a pretty casual arrangement, perfectly acceptable if you were white. But because the children of my uncle's community were black, they were not allowed to attend the school that he went to because the teacher at the time that was there who had total control of who came in that door physically barred them from coming in. He was a deeply racist, unapologetically racist man. He would not let them come through the doors. One day, a woman from the community went to take her children there. She thought if she went with them, he would have to let them in. He spat at her, so her husband, he spat on her face, so her husband went to talk to him later. They got into a fight, and the man from the community, the black man from the community, was arrested and taken away. I spent a lot of time in the Provincial Archives of Alberta studying this case. It's a file about this thick. It does not say a word about that segregation and discrimination that was taking place. It doesn't say a word about that teacher having disrespected that woman in that way. All it talks about is these lawless Negroes who think they can take the law into their own hands and do whatever they want. And um, that man went to jail. And that's the end of that story if you don't know the story, if you didn't have an Uncle Andrew to tell you about that day, that awful day, what it was like for him. Um, all you have is the information that's contained in the Provincial Archives of Alberta. I share that anecdote because I want to um, enter into my theme, which is the act of translation. So I want you to think about what Uncle Andrew's life might have been like without that incident, one of many, 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 many others um, that I could have shared with you that he persevered through um, to get to the point where he established a church in Calgary in 1948. I'm the one in the front row closer to the center that's turned around and looking back, I have braids in my hair. Um, this was our annual Christmas concert, and I think it was probably 1959, just judging by my age there. I wanted to make some connections between my life and his, and how much I appreciate what it was like for him to make space for us. Because it has actually been quite challenging to make space for my work and for these stories in my life as a historian and author. You might look at my life and think, successful author, decent resume, and that's true, and I have a good life. But there are many experiences of my life, both as a child, um, one of which I'll share with you again, one of many incidents that I could share with you, of uh, when I was playing with my dolls on the street one day and a group of boys from a house across the street came over, took my dolls away, took off their clothing, called me the N-word, flung my dolls all over the street, ripped off one of the heads of my dolls. I could actually live without that experience and I may have been better off without it. I know there's that saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I'm not 100% convinced that that is true. Yes, I survived that day. Yes, Uncle Andrew survived that day. Yes, he survived all the incredible challenges of trying to make space for us in this city, as did Luella Bellamy, who opened up the chicken fry, as did John Ware's nephew, who opened up that nightclub. Countless stories I could share with you. I survived the rejections I got when I first started to try to publish, when I was sending my first book out, Pouring Down Rain, including many stupid things that were said to me, like there aren't enough black people in Canada for us to justify publishing your work. But I don't know how I survived that. Young, I, was, I was in my 20s. Young writers are notoriously um, fragile, <laughs> and getting re rejections early in a person's career often stops people right there. I don't know why it didn't stop me. I don't know why I persevered. I do know that I believed in the importance of our narrative. I do know that I felt the community that I grew up in, while faced with many challenges, was also very magical. That it was a community that had very much made lemonade out of lemons. 
So I'm not going to ask you to imagine a world without racism. I think that's a very big imagine, and it's a good one, but that's not what I'm gonna ask of you today. I just want you to look at this photograph of these kids, these lovely kids whose parents, whose people like Uncle Andrew, whose porters, whose, whose everybody, was just wanting a, a good world and a good place for them. And um, I want to tell you that many of these kids didn't make it. Many of these, there, there are several suicides among this group, um, many other challenges that were very directly related to the kinds of incidents and things that happened in our lives that we really could have done without. So I want you to think about, well, this was the, the church that Uncle Andrew eventually established in Inglewood, it's still there. Um, he's, he's long ago passed away. Um, I want you to think about not, not what if there was no racism. I want you to, to translate to what a life would have been like or what it could be like moving forward from today if you had already known this history before you came in this building today. What if this story was so deeply embedded in your own life because you'd learned it at school or because you'd learned it from your neighbors, because everybody knew it. How would my life be different if everybody knew this story? How would Uncle Andrew's life have been different if that teacher knew the story of those people that he was preventing from coming through the door? Most importantly, how would your life be different? How would your life be different if this story, which is my story, and which I firmly believe belongs to all of us, what if it really was yours? What if it really had been given to you and, and was just a regular part of your daily life? And that's where I'm gonna end, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for uh, persevering, for your resilience, um, for your deep uh, faith that these stories do matter. <clears throat> and they matter not just for black people, uh, but they matter for, for us, for our communities and for our world. And we will be different people because we've heard them today. And I, my prayer is that we will learn to translate uh, all that you've given us in ways that will be meaningful, that will make a difference for you and many others, including ourselves. So thank you for your gift for us today. I also want to thank um, Miranda for being here and for sharing your musical gifts with us, and also Sandra for sharing your musical gifts, and we hope this is a, in part a small way of celebrating what truly is a rich and vibrant history in our midst and in our communities, and uh, one that we must treasure as a gift and learn to live with differently. So let's um, stand and sing now. We're going to sing a song we hope in some ways is a response to what you've shared with us. And may this be a blessing and an offering back to you, Cheryl. River. 